All right, we're going to begin the second chapter of Matthew, which is the chapter that you and I know is the story of the coming of the Magi. Remember, Matthew doesn't have any shepherds. He doesn't have any angels in the sky. He doesn't have any of that. He has just the announcement to Joseph. And then he begins chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is this child who has been born King of the Jews? In St. Luke's Gospel, Mary and Joseph live in Nazareth. Not in Matthew's Gospel. They've never been in Nazareth. They live in Bethlehem. They have a house in Bethlehem. That's where their residence is for Matthew. His job is to get them to Nazareth. And he does that in the, by, the end of the first, uh, by the end of the second chapter. But they start out, their, their home is in Bethlehem. And that's, again, important because that's the place David was born. So this is the son of David, born in the house of David, Bethlehem. St. Luke says they went to register uh, in Bethlehem uh, because Joseph was of the house and family of David. All right, where is this newborn child, newborn king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. There was a tradition in the ancient world that when a momentous event was to occur, good or bad, that there would be signs in the heavens, that there would be signs in the stars. And to have a, a star appear, if you will, out of the, out of the blue, <laughs> um, that is different from what normally is there was an indication something is happening or is about to happen. Then there were other ways of, of uh, working through that to see you know, what is it that's about to happen? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Is it a... And the birth of a, of a royal personage was one of the things that, that um, the ancient people believed was foreshadowed in the heavens. So a star appears. And these people who are astrologers, they're scientists, they're people who study the heavens. Um, they're, um, they're mathematicians. They're, um, so the word wise means wise in a very uh, educated fashion. They're not kings. They're not kings at all. Um, they're probably from Persia. The earliest iconography, the earliest pictures we have uh, of them from the early centuries, the second and third centuries, show them in the trappings of, uh, uh, of a Persian aristocrat. Uh, and so out of that, the assumption is that uh, they maybe came from, from Persia. So they come to Jerusalem, and they're looking for this newborn king. When Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where this Messiah was to be born. He didn't know. Nobody knew. <coughs> they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written in the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least of the princes of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Those who should know where this is to happen are those who should know the scriptures. And they don't. They don't know where it's going to happen. Those who have an excuse for not knowing what's going on, they know. <laughs> Paul, in one of his letters, says 
that God gave to the Jews the Torah, the written text, to know the truth. He gave to the Gentiles all of nature. Nature is the book God writes. And out of nature, the Gentiles discover the person of God. So you've got the, the, um, the Magi, the, the travelers who read nature and get the answer. And you've got the Jews who have the scriptures and don't know what the answer is. So they tell them. Now, Herod is a shifty character. He is not a nice man. He is, in fact, probably crazy. Uh, he murders most of his family. He murders a wife. He murders a number of kids. He's afraid people are going to take his power. He's maniacal about that. Uh, he sees a, a, a coup under every rock. Um, he's crazy. He's crazy. <laughs> he is also, though, he's also a person of some shrewdness. He entered into a relationship with the Romans that he promised to, in effect, act as a servant of the Roman Empire if they would allow him to continue to rule as king. And they did. And so he became, if you will, a, a vassal of the Roman emperor. He was also a tremendous builder. The temple that is described in the, in the, the Gospels is, is Herod's temple. It's the second temple. The temple of Solomon was destroyed. This is the second temple. Um, and it was under construction for over 40 years. Uh, the area around Caesarea Philippi on the northern part of Palestine uh, is the maritime area, and there are, there are large palaces there that, um, that Herod built. Um, that huge Mount Masada that is where the, the final overthrow of the, of the Jews took place by the Romans, uh, it's just a gigantic plateau that is just hugely above the earth. And over 100 and f about 150 Jews, they fled Jerusalem, and they ended up on top of this plateau. And they lived there for over a year while the Romans tried to get them down, tried to assault them, tried to build all kinds of weapons of war that could, could get them down. In the end, they killed themselves. Um, well, they, were, they had nothing more to eat, so they took their own lives. You can still go to Masada. Uh, they have, uh, there's a trolley car that will take you to the top now. You don't have, you, you can walk, but it, I mean, it's, it's hundreds of steps to get up to the top. But it, it is burning hot, probably between maybe 100 and 110 degrees would be the you know, the summer temperature up there uh, with no shade, just top of a mountain. Anyway, this is Herod, the crazy builder. Uh, then he secretly calls them aside, the wise men aside, and he learns from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Now that's important because he wants to calculate the age of this king. So if he finds out when the star appeared, he knows roughly when the king was born. Then he says, go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I may also go and pay him homage. And he sends them out. Then we're told, when they heard the king, they set out, and ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star had stopped, they were overjoyed, they were overwhelmed with joy, and on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary. The house, the Bethlehem house, the home of Joseph and Mary. So the star continues to lead them. This, this is the story. The star continues to lead them, and leads them to the place of the child. And then they open their treasure chests and they offer gifts to the child, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, 
There's nothing in the text that says there were three of them. It says there were three gifts, but it doesn't say there were three people. When you read the scriptures, a good rule of thumb is not only to read what's written there, but to read what's not written there. <laughs> Observe what the author does not say. He does not say there were three. He says there were three gifts. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went home by another route. They had a dream. There's no reference in there that there was an angel that spoke to them or anything like that. It was just in a dream. They got the, the, the message to return by a different route. Okay, the, these figures, these visitors, are meant to say something to the Gentile Christians, not the Jewish Christians. There's a lot said to the Jewish Christians in the first chapter. This is really a message to the Gentile Christians. That in the very, very beginning, it was God's plan that outsiders be called within. That the, the barrier between Jew and non-Jew needs to be uh, overcome. And so these visitors, these persons to whom the revelation has taken place, it's been revealed to them. They are non-Jews. So that's a, that's a key piece for this piece to be there. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Now here, there, Joseph has a dream, but the angel comes to him. He says, take the child and your mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Joseph is called to go into Egypt. Joseph is in danger and he goes into Egypt. The story of Joseph in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, Joseph is thrown into a cistern and is sold and is taken into Egypt. Both Josephs. Hmm. That's, a, that's a conscious effort to connect the two. Huh? So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. Okay. Herod dies. The danger is no longer there. Joseph goes back and we're told um, Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But then he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod. When Herod died, his kingdom was divided into three parts. And th three of his, his sons each got a part. And Archelaus was at least as vicious as his father. And so when Joseph heard that Archelaus was overseeing Judea, um, he said, we can't go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. And there he made his home in a town called Nazareth. So that what had been a, a spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, he will be called a Nazarene. So that's how Matthew gets him into Nazareth. Because the story starts, I mean, the public life of Jesus starts in Nazareth. I mean, that's where he begins his preaching. 
in St. Matthew's Gospel, almost all of the rest of the story takes place in the northern part of Palestine, the part called um, Galilee. It's only at the end of the story, the, the, uh, the story of the passion and death and resurrection of Jesus, that that takes place in the south, in Judea, in Jerusalem. So almost all of Jesus' ministry is in the north. And the north is by far the more cosmopolitan area. In the sense, it is the most diverse area. The south is the most rigidly uh, observant area, which is understandable because the temple is in the south. You know? um, so it would stand that, that all of the ritual and all of the rules and all of the regs uh, would be more prominent around where the temple was. So uh, Joseph and Mary and Joseph, Joseph and Mary and Jesus end up in St. Matthew's Gospel in um, in Nazareth. All right, are we okay? All right. Chapter three, chapter three, and most of chapter four are kind of a. Um, a transition piece. So in chapter 3 we're going to hear about John the Baptist. In chapter 3 we're going to hear about the, um, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. And then in 4 we're going to hear about the temptation in the desert. And those three instances, those three events in a sense are, are initiatory to Jesus' public, public ministry. We don't learn in Matthew who John the Baptist is. It's in Luke that we learn that John the Baptist is the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah, who are relatives of Mary. So, so John and Jesus have a relationship, a, a cousin-like relationship to each other. It would appear that, that uh, at least in the way the stories are told, John seems to be somewhat older than, than Jesus. but. Um, St. Luke indicates that they were born about the same time. Um, he lives in the desert. He is a, uh, an ascetic. He, um, he's out of step with everything that would be normal. You can imagine, I mean, his poor parents, they had prayed for years to have a child, and they get this kid, and he, he, this is the way he ends up. <laughs> Elizabeth probably hates going to the grocery store, you know. <laughs> so he's, he's in the desert, and this is the part of the text that we're going to be using this, this, this weekend um, in church. Um, He's in the wilderness in, in, uh, in Judea, and he is crying out, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Matthew said, this is the one of whom Isaiah says, a voice of someone in the desert cries out, prepare the way of the Lord, make his way straight. Now, preparing a way in the, in, the, uh, in the desert is a terribly, terribly difficult thing. <laughs> because the sand blows constantly, especially at night. And so you may work out a path during the day, but the next morning you don't see it. And it was only recently, probably in the past 40 years, that a real highway was built. And it was um, built in Jordan. Uh, between Amman in the north, the capital in the north, and the Bay of Aqaba in the south. And it's called the King's Highway, <laughs> is what it's called. Um, and it is. It's, it's a highway that is built up. I mean, it's, it's, it's lifted off the sand, off the, off the earth, so that the sand can blow, but it's not going to reach the top of the, of the highway. So the highway's safe. Well, if people are going to travel that desert, they're going to need some way to, to, to navigate. And so this one is called to prepare the way of the Lord and make his way straight. Mm -hmm. Then we're told a curious thing about John, that he, for his clothing he wore camel's hair and his diet was locusts and wild honey. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, that means there's got to be some money here. 
I mean, camels were incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. You did not kill your camel. Your camel was your transportation. It would be like taking apart your car to find some pieces to fix your washing machine. You just wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't do it. Well, he somehow got hold of a camel's hair outfit. And so he wore that and he wore a leather belt around his waist, and the, he ate um, locusts and wild honey. Now, if you watch TV, who's this guy who goes to all these exotic places? Andrew Zimmern. Who? Andrew Zimmern. No, Bodine, isn't it? Bodine. 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 Well, remember, he goes and he eats all over all the, the world, and he eats the most incredible things, the slimy things, the crawling things, the, you know, he, he, he just eats all this stuff. Well, what he's showing us is that there are significant areas of the world in which insects are part of the diet. People eat insects. And so he did eat, eat grasshoppers. And he ate wild honey. Now wild honey doesn't come from bees. Wild honey comes from dates. The, the, date, the date trees, once the dates mature, they begin to leak juice, a very sweet honey juice. And so um, in the late summer and early fall of the year at the, in, on the oasis where the, the trees are, you will see the, uh, uh, like a muslin, a, a muslin net that is around the fruit so that number one, the birds don't get at it, and number two, it catches the honey. It catches the honey. So this, this very um, delightful food, this wild honey, is part of, of John's, um, John's diet. Now he's in the Judean desert and that is the same area where the, the um, when the scrolls of Qumran were discovered. And it's in that area that there is also at this time a, a religious group called the Essenes and they are a, a, a monastic group. They're out in the desert. They live a very, uh, very much a monastic life. And the assumption is that in some way, John had connection with these people. So he's calling out and he's saying, you know, repent for the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then we're told people from Jerusalem and from all of Judea and from all the regions surrounding the Jordan, they came out to see him and to be baptized in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, this is a baptism of repentance. This is not like Christian baptism. This is, this is a washing. It's a purification. Uh, Jews were very big about purifying, so... Any time they, they had touched anything that would be considered uh, uh, contaminating them, they would have to wash. So for instance, in the story of the wedding feast at Cana, we're told that there are these six stone water jars by the door, and they were used for washing, so that when people came in from the outside, they could, they could wash. They could wash their hands, their face, their feet. They could, if you will, get the outside out and come on inside. So um, these people came for baptism, for cleansing, uh, for getting rid of whatever was impure uh, in their life. Then we're told he saw some Pharisees and Sadducees coming out to be baptized, and he yelled at them, you brood of vipers, who told you to get out of town before the calamity hits? Start doing some decent things and prove that you've, re you've uh, reformed your life and are worthy to baptize. <laughs> I don't want you guys around here. <laughs> Very direct guy, huh? Uh, John the Baptist was never known to be a person of nuance. <laughs> then he says to them, 
And don't you dare tell me that you are children of Abraham. For God can raise children of Abraham out of these very stones that you're standing on. Now the pride of the Pharisees was that they claimed to be children of Abraham. Remember in the 8th chapter of St. John's Gospel where Jesus confronts them in the temple and um, he affirms the fact that he, that he and his father are one. And they take, they take great exception to that. And they said, and you're not even, you know, 50 years old and you claim to have seen, or you, yeah, you claim to have seen Abraham. And Jesus says, long before Abraham ever existed, I existed. Abraham is the, the rock, the foundation. And they claim as part of their, their uh, credential that they're children, they're sons of Abraham. Remember the story of Jesus' genealogy. It starts that Abraham became Isaac, or gave birth to Isaac. All right. Then just using a, 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 an agricultural the metaphor, he's told them they better repent. And he says, they've already laid the ax to the root of the tree. And they will cut it down, and all that does not bear good fruit will be thrown into the fire and burned. So that's the, that's the introduction we get, uh, we get to John the baptizer. Then John says, I am baptizing you with water, but there is one coming after me who is mightier than I am. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandal, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So he gives, if you will, he gives direction to the people that he's with. I'm not the end of this story. There's someone coming yet. And this one is coming with great power. And then we're told that Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Jesus makes sure, or by Matthew makes sure that we understand that Jesus is fully a Jew. He is fully a part of his people. He undergoes baptism not because he necessarily needs it, but he undergoes baptism as a sign that he's no different than the others, that he's not royalty or anything like that. Then there's an argument that goes back and forth between Jesus and John, who's going to baptize whom? And Jesus says, just do it, let's get it over with. <laughs> um, and when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and the Spirit of God descended dove-like on him. And a voice was heard saying, this is my son, the beloved, with him I am well pleased. All right, this is the public affirmation of Jesus as being divine. This is my son. Also notice again, notice what it says and what it doesn't say. It says that the heavens opened and the Spirit of God dove-like alighted on it. It doesn't say the Spirit of God in the form of a dove dove-like. The Spirit of God flutters down gently and rests upon him. Now, I'm not saying that the Spirit did not come in the form of a dove, but I, you certainly can't prove it by the text. You can prove it by art, you know. <laughs> That's the way the artists draw it. But dove-like, in a gentle manner came down and rested upon him, and the voice was heard from the heavens, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the moment in which the public, if you will, is informed that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, they don't accept that. They, they don't accept that. Some writers say that it's in this moment that Jesus was given his destiny. That from this moment on, the direction was set for him. The next time that this, the, uh, the heavens will open and the Father will speak will be at the Transfiguration.
Okay, uh, any questions about that, the baptism piece? All four Gospels have the event recorded. The baptism is part of the story in all four Gospels, as is the, the next piece, the temptation in the desert. So we're told simply Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So Jesus doesn't wander into the, into the a, a desert. He is led by the Spirit. He's escorted by the Spirit into the desert. This is important part of what has gone before. This is an important corollary to the baptism. In one of the Gospels, it says the Spirit drove him into the desert. Must mean he took a car. I mean, he, <laughs> he shoved him into the desert. He shoved him into the desert. And he went there to be tempted. And what he's tempted by is he's given three temptations. You and I know the story. That he's tempted, he's, he fasts for 40 days. And then the tempter says, if you truly are the Son of God, command that these stones be turned into bread. So he's tempted to surrender to satisfaction, to physical satisfaction. And he says, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Then we're told that the same person, the, the tempter, takes him up to uh, a, high, um, uh, a high point of the temple and says to him, now if you truly are the Son of God and he's going to take care of you, then prove it. You know, uh, throw yourself down. Jump off this high point, and if you really are the Son of God, then he's going to send his angels, and they're going to hold you up. You won't even as much as dash your toe against a stone. You'll be totally safe. If what you're saying is true, throw yourself down. So it is the temptation to tempt God. It's the temptation to test God. And Jesus says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Then we're told that he was taken to a high mountain and he was shown all, the, all of the possessions of the earth, all the, the kingdoms of the world, and said, all of this has been handed over to me. All of this is in my hands. I will give all of it to you if you will fall down and adore me. And Jesus says, the Lord your God shall you serve and him only shall you adore. And we're told that at that point, the tempter left him only to return at a later date. The later date is Gethsemane. Again, when there is a threefold connection, like there's a threefold connection here. So he's, these, these temptations are, are, are basic and they're the temptations of humanity. The temptations to succumb to, to simply immediate satisfaction, immediate gratification, gratification of one's senses, to be, to, be, to be driven by one's feelings and one's senses and one's desires. That's the first temptation. The second temptation is the temptation to bargain with God. I will do this if you will do that. The temptation to Try to put God on your level, to have a negotiation with him. And that's, that's part of the human experience, too. You know, I'm in trouble. What I'll do is I'll promise to do this if you just get me out of this mess. You know, that kind of thing. And then the thirdly is the, the temptation to power. Power over another, power over a community, power, you know, just power. The temptation to to dominate, the temptation to, um, to subjugate another. And uh, all of that saying is that, again, the humanity of Jesus is that he's being tempted in the same way as any other human being would be tempted. Now, these temptations have played out in literature a lot. Uh, and uh, just one of them is, uh, is in the poem of T.S. Eliot, the play that T.S. Eliot wrote called Murder in the Cathedral. 
in which he has Thomas Beckett before he's slaughtered on the floor of the, of the monastery cathedral. The tempter comes to him and tempts him three times. And again, there are versions of these three temptations. So the, the, uh, the text itself, the, the, the story, is, uh, is kind of a story of every person. Okay. Then we're told that um, Jesus comes out of the desert and he hears that John the baptizer has been arrested. And I remember he's in the south area where, where, uh, where the Jordan is. He flees to go up north to Galilee and there he's going to stay. So he leaves Nazareth in the south and he makes his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. And from that time on, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of God has come near. And then is the story of his, of his choosing his disciples as he walks along the Sea of Galilee. He sees Peter and Andrew in the, the boat mending their, their nets. Okay, we're over time. That's uh, the end of chapter four. So that's where we'll pick up next Saturday. Bring the copy of, your, of the New Testament with you. That is, that is helpful. Thank you.